All right. So today um, I'm talking to my buddy Greg and we're talking about how sometimes failure teaches us the most. They offer us our biggest lessons and sometimes lead us to our biggest successes even. So Greg, I know this has happened to you. T tell us a story about how your failure some has uh, led to your success. Yeah, this probably goes back to the early 90s, actually. <clears throat> probably my most memorable situation was uh, uh, I had uh, one of my clients asked me to come and join them and run their business. And it was called Infinite Connections. We were Deepak Chopra's representatives in Canada. And uh, we were doing a primordial sound meditation. She went down to work with Deepak for three months while I took over and ran the business and uh, built the business and, you know, set up the venue, recruited people, sold tickets, that sort of thing. Built this whole team. <clears throat> it was really neat because we sold, um, we had 385 people out to the, at that particular time, the world's largest primordial sound meditation seminar that was done by Deepak back in the day. Uh, although that was small for, that is small by a lot of standards uh, for what Deepak would normally do. And so <clears throat> Uh, I ended up exiting that business uh, about six uh, about six months after my son was born. <clears throat> so uh, my partner and I weren't getting along, so I chose to kind of take stage right. And it was really interesting because my son was about six months old, new father, new responsibilities, new sense of burden. My uh, wife at the time, she was suffering from a severe case of postpartum. So I had a lot going on. <clears throat> and um, so I exited the business, sold my shares back to my partner. And I ended up with, um, I, had, I think I had $300 in the bank. <laughs> wow. Six, six month old son, starting from scratch, starting from ground zero. Because I'd put my coaching business on hold. <clears throat> that I, my, my design and corporate business, I, I had design business and a coaching business. I put it on hold to do this. So I was starting from scratch again in a way. So I'm sitting there with, by my computer, had my son wrapped up, uh, sit, laying him on the floor while he was sleeping while I'm working. And um, I'm thinking, okay, I need to make money. I need to make money. How am I going to make money? Well, I decided that uh, I needed to do a seminar. And that gave birth to, I started talking to people. I gave birth to something I called the Marketing Safari Seminar. So I decided to start doing that seminar. <clears throat> Once a week. Originally, I thought about doing it once a month, but then I realized, geez, I'd have to really have a big win in every single seminar to make enough money to be able to pay my bills. And it just, it was like, man, it's not very viable. But hey, maybe I could do it every week. I'll do the seminar every single week. So I did it every single week. And because um, then, in a period of three months, I'd learn as much. As somebody that did it only once a month, it would take them a year. I get 12 events in in a three-month period. If someone else only do it once a month, it would take a year to get those lessons. So I thought, well, that, that made sense to me at the time. So, um, so, that's what I, so that's what I did. And that particular exercise probably taught me one of my greatest lessons. And that is sometimes you can only learn your way out of your problems. There's no amount of money you can use to solve a learning problem. Hmm. I still, so it, it's about, so I realized, you know, as I look back on it now, I realized that uh, learning my way out of the problems, uh, which to me came down to being willing to adapt quickly, listen to, listen to people, and then clarify what I thought, um, I, what I thought I was hearing, and then adapt again. Adapt, listen, clarify. Adapt, listen, clarify. And, and that's what I just started doing is I, so what happened? I remember the very first uh, workshop that I put on, I invited everybody that I knew that was close to me, friends and fa friends mostly, you know, and a good friend of mine who was a, a Toastmaster and he had done a lot of workshops, came to my workshop and um, about 20 minutes into it, he got up. I thought he was going to the bathroom. He never came back. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And so I followed up with it. He told me the next day, he said, it's the worst seminar I've ever been to ever. He says, well, let me give you three tips. Here's three things you did well. Here's three, three things you need to do to improve. And it was, it was, it, it hit me hard, right? It hit me hard. And at the same time, 
it, even though it hit me hard, there were some great lessons in it. And so I made some adjustments and I put another seminar the very next week and the week after and the week. I did that every single week for six years straight. Wow. And, uh, and you know, what ended up happening that where I got the confidence for doing this is that I had a complete confidence in my ability to ask what I call a quality question. And in other words, I had confidence in my ability to ask people questions to help people uncover and grow. Uh, I, and I was just so damn curious uh, that, you know, I, I kept asking questions. So I'd, I'd, you know, I had my workshop. So these were small workshops. These workshops, they were 39 bucks to come to a three hour evening workshop. Uh, I would have, I think the largest I ever had was 14 or 15, but typically average somewhere around nine or 10 to 12 people every single week. And that was fine with me because uh, it was a nice intimate setting and I, I rented a boardroom, it worked great. Uh, then what I did, uh, people would come up to me and say, hey, you know, this was great. You know, you have anything more? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know what? How about I get back to you? I'm working on something right now. I'll get back to you in a week or so. So based on the feedback, I sat down and I worked out uh, an outline for a seven seminar series over a period of three months. And initially I sold it for 750 bucks. And uh, I went back, I started going back to those people and I started selling into it. Ultimately over, <clears throat> I think over the course of six years, because no, what I would do is the people that would come to the weekly marketing safari seminar and came up and talked to me afterwards and said, hey, you know, that was, that was good. I really liked what you said about this and this. I would make a mental note and I'd follow up with each of them and have a coffee. And we'd sit down and talk face to face. And then I'd, I'd say, hey, I got this other thing. And remember you asked about that? Here's that other thing. And they'd talk about it. And I'd, I'd coach them, help them find some value. And eventually, over a period of time, over a period of a two or three years, I got so that if there were, uh, say, 10 people at the workshop, four or five would come up each, each night. If I followed up with four, eventually I got that more, you know, three to four would sign up into my seminar. It was amazing. It was fabulous. I thought I was damn brilliant, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but the thing was, is that uh, I was just, uh, was constantly asking questions. And I guess when I say, you know, my, my greatest, you know, I, fundamentally, uh, my work, first workshop was an absolute failure. And then probably the second and third one. But, you know, I got better at it and I kept at it. And the thing is, is I had confidence in my ability to provide the conversational leadership with my clients, with these customers that were coming through. And so what I would do, I'd start every workshop and I'd say, okay, what would be one thing you would need to learn today to make this workshop 100% worth the time, effort, and money to be here? One thing, one question. It would absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you got that answer, it would make it worth your time, effort, and energy, and money. And so I get the questions, I write them up, and I paste them up. I remember the first few workshops, I had like three or four sheets and all kinds of questions. And so I look at those sheets and go, you know, secretly to myself, holy crap, half of them I don't have answers to. <laughs> I, have, I have no content in the workshop to deal with that. So what I did is uh, I, throughout the, the workshop, I'd say, okay, we'd answer this one. I'd cross it off. Did you get that answer? Did that answer your question? Yeah. Cross it off. Say, well, and then there is this other one. So who asked this question? So what, whatever they would ask. And then I'd keep, they'd ask, they, they'd put up their hand. I'd say, oh, well, what was that question? Can you tell me more about that? And I'd keep asking questions, keep asking questions. And eventually, we would together arrive at the answer. And what I realized is it wasn't so much that I needed to have the answer but that my clients and I could arrive at the answer and the solution together. And that's where I really bought into coaching and realized the power of, of, of a question that, it, that I didn't need to know the answer as a coach. I needed to be able to ask the right question to help my clients uncover, you know, their own brilliance, their own information, their own perspective. Because what I, what I found, Phil, is a quality question provides perspectives and it kind of takes us out, gives us kind of that helicopter view. We can get a bigger look at the situation. And so that's how it all started. One of the things that I, 
that I taught in the, in the program that followed was something I called the 30, my 30-30 list. This was a list of 30 people that were going to buy in 30 days. It was amazing because when those, all those people that would come up, I would, I would add them to this 30 list and with their name and phone number. And I'd phone them and we'd have coffee, we'd have face-to-face. And I'd ask them how the workshop was, you know, what are they using, what's working, what's not working, how can I help them, add value, value, you know, support them. Uh, and then I'd say, well, you know, I have this other thing. And then we'd talk about it. Is that something you might be interested in? Yeah, tell me more about that. So then I would just start talking about it. I had a one-page flyer with the seven seminars with a one-sentence description under each seminar. And I just puked my guts out. I just kept talking <laughs> and explaining to them what the intention was behind each of them. And people would say, that sounds good. I'd say, great. Sign this piece of paper. Give me a check. In those days, there was no mobile internet or swiping or a square or whatever. Because in those days, the old farts had to do it the old way. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's, um, that, that's my story, man. Well, let's talk, though, about the feeling there, Greg. Because I, I think that's something you kind of there, – there's, there's some motion inside of you, right? The fear, perhaps. I mean, you said yep. you have $300 in the bank, a six-month-old son, and a wife with postpartum. And you felt like a failure, like, holy crap, I'm going to deliver this program. And then you, you hoped that it would be successful and then it ended up flopping. So how did you, let's talk about the feeling because I think as, as entrepreneurs, right, we get through this, but if we don't examine that feeling, right, or we don't resonate with that, right, because we don't even know what the heck it is. That's probably new because I know for me, Greg, I, I'm often successful, but, and when I'm not, I'm like, what the hell is this? Like, the, right. I don't know this feeling, and it isn't always failure, but it's something else. So can you take us through those feelings, please? It's uncomfortable. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for asking that. Well, I guess the thing is, is that I, I saw all of that, and I said, I asked myself a question. What do I have complete confidence in myself about? And that one thing was my ability to ask quality questions, and learn and adapt. It's a gift I got from my father in a conversation that I had with him a couple months before he died. And because he wanted me to go to university, I had thought about going to university, but I was too busy driving my car, working at the gas station, making money, and kind of chasing girls. <laughs> you know, and it was, it, university seemed boring to me, you know, uh, compared to everything else that I was living at the time. And he said something to me. He said, you know, you got, when, you, when you get an education, you might, you have to pay to go to school. But you, you could probably, you know, at that time, you're going to come out of school. You're going to have a higher standard of living than if you don't go to school. And he said to me, and I'll never forget it, because it was a couple months later my dad died. And I did this, 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 it was, I call it the conversation on the orange couch. We had this orange nylon couch in the in the, in the rumpus room. And he said, it's going to be very important for you that you understand how you learn and you're going to be need to learn to adapt. My father had a business degree. Um, he, he got a business degree from Alberta college and he actually, and he served in the second world war. He was in headquarters as corporal doing working in headquarters. And so he knew a few things. He, he himself failed out of business as it turns out, because he, he had a big heart. And at a time when he probably should have laid people off, he, his justification to my mother, and he never said this, my mother told me this, is that those men all have families they have to feed. We're going to get through this. And ultimately, he didn't get through it through, you know, losing a contract and having a very long spring thaw and not being able to move the oil rigs. He was a, there was an oil rig moving business. There was nothing moving. And he put it, and in a sense, his good heart put him out of business. But the, fee, the whole thing of the fear is I absolutely faced the fear, look at it, and I realized – I couldn't chase the fear. I couldn't feed the fear, but I had to isolate it. I had to partition it by uh, choosing to focus on what I didn't have fear around. And so what I knew is I absolutely had complete confidence in my ability to ask questions because I constantly got that feedback from, you know, prospects and clients and, 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 wow, that's a good question. How do you come up with these questions? <clears throat> I don't know. I just, I've been curious. I was born curious. And actually, you know, I studied my archetypes and, and, you know, you look at 
You can look at Mayan calendar, Mayan, Mayan cross. You can look at astrology. Just, I'm, a, yeah, I'm a curious sucker. You know, if there's a mountain climb, I want to climb the mountain. I want to see what's on the other side of the mountain. Oh, there's a corner. I wonder what's around the corner. That's just my nature. If there's an idea, oh, what's the idea beneath the idea beneath the idea is what drives me. So that's what I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I did that, and if I, if I was willing to get on the phone, and if I got my ask on, <laughs> ASK, and I asked people to come, people came. And then I started doing a fax broadcasting, like we would probably call it email marketing today. I did fax broadcasting, and it worked. Awesome. Awesome. So, so focus, on, focus on what you have and what you have confidence in and use that one thing to is basically isolates and nullifies everything else. Yeah, and to take the confidence that you have in the one area and use that to kind of blanket over the rest to help you stay confident and feel good about that which maybe you don't have experience and maybe you've never put on a seminar before or you've never right. asked for money before. And that's the very interesting thing. It's funny you say that because the, uh, when I had my design business, I had clients, I did great work for, we, so I, we did do annual reports, brochures, direct mail, that sort of, we design it, print it, do the, we did the complete implementation, hire the photographers, hire the copywriters, did the whole thing. And, you know, sometimes my clients had financial problems and they couldn't pay my bill. So that was a problem for me. So I'd say, well, tell me what's going on. And I'd listen. And I'd ask questions. And I'd listen. I'd say, well, it sounds to me like you, you need to get some finance, some new financing from your bank. Yeah, you're right. But they ask for, they're asking me for a business plan. Oh, they want a business plan? Yeah, I'll write it for you. <laughs> and at that point, I'd never written a business plan. But I knew if I asked the right questions, and Doug, I could teach myself to write a business plan. And that's what I did. And over a period of time, because like writing a business plan took, it would take me 50 to 300 hours to write a business plan, depending on the, on, on the business plan. I started keeping notes because it was pretty complicated. It was pretty easy to get lost. Then I realized that, that's the book. So I created an ebook and put it online. I started selling it. I was selling it for 20 bucks. Then McGraw-Hill came along and found me. And they recruited me to write a book on buying a business and then I pitched them the idea of writing a book on business plan and today that business plan book is still selling it's still current it's uh so it's 10 years 10 years old it's still current um and it's been translated into Spanish it's been adopted by some universities in Central America and Spain as a textbook and it's available as an ebook it just still blows me away because what I did is I took that and again I, I li ate lived in breathe writing that book for a four month period around the clock more or less and but it's again i was asking the questions doing the work asking the questions adapting adjusting learning adapt ad learn adjust so like you say take that you know all of us have a significant strength somewhere and you need and by you know i think the other thing phil is just the brutal reality of the fact that being a new father, I was driven, man. I looked into that little face. I was driven. You know, lead follower, get the hell out of my way. Yeah. That's the best answer I have. Yeah, no, that's that's good. So um Yeah, and it's it's interesting, Greg, because you talk about how you found out that they needed a business plan and that right. ended up being a business then that you started business that you learned and then a book that you wrote and that it continues to live on. So, so if we're thinking about kind of wrapping this up in a ball, right? Yes. Would you say that one of the most important things is not only to be intensely curious about others, but also to be intensely curious about ourselves? Oh yeah. Thank you for that. That's a great distinction. Yeah. To the degree that I'm willing to reflect and learn and grow and look at myself, so goes my life. So it's that, uh, I call it, I think of it, I, I talked about it a little bit on Anchor recently. I, uh, I refer to it as radical responsibility. It's all me. It's all my stuff. You know, 
the reaction, the emotional reaction, the challenges, the stuff I'm facing in my life, it's all me. And, you know, I had to learn how to not indulge in the blame game. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it, you know, I've got big lessons on that the last five or six years. Lots of very interesting life challenges. And it's been, it's been, I think I've learned more in the last three years about myself than I've learned in the last, my entire life. And uh, I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. <laughs> Because I still got, um, I still got thirty years. Uh, 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 you know, I <clears throat> I did a uh, a life expectancy quiz, and it asked you about your medical history and stuff like that, and your lifestyle and stuff. And uh, it estimated that my life expectancy to be ninety two. So the way I figure, I still got thirty one years of prime time going. <laughs> awesome, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So cool, man. Well. So out of curious, let's, let's end this on a curious note. So sure. what's one question, Greg, that we should use to ask ourselves mm. when we're in the midst of what we feel is a big colossal failure to help us dig out of that pit? Mm. Okay, first of all, I guess I would say rather than, to be, I'm going to take it, try to take it one step before you get to the place where I'm a fucking failure. Excuse my English. Uh, when you feel that emotional charge and you feel that sinking feeling is to breathe and reflect and say, what's this about? And second, I have to give you two questions. <laughs> what's this about? What? do I need to learn? Mm, what's this about and what do I need to learn? Those are powerful. Yeah. And it, it, sometimes the answers come back like a two by four upside the head. It, sometimes it's incredibly obvious. <laughs> and sometimes it's like, really? I got to learn that. <laughs> I mean, I had to learn to over, to, to, put my fear of rejection on hold and make phone calls. Cause literally the more phone calls I made, the more no's I got, I asked more questions. I learned, I adapted, I changed my approach. Probably in that first month, I probably adjusted uh, the flyer I had for the marketing safari seminar about a dozen times based on the feedback that I was getting based on the questions I would get from people calling. It, you know, just that constant learning. And so I think that there's, so um, I'm going on and on here, but give yourself the willing, the permission to learn organically. You don't need to know everything. I guarantee you, if you're in business, your customers will teach you how to serve them and sell them if you ask the question and if you listen. Mm, that's good. Well, let's, that, I think that answers the second question, right? How do we get there? But Let's unpack that first one a little more, Greg. Sure. What's this about? Talk to me about what that means and how, how we even uncover that answer. Well, for me, I can tell you what I do is this. So if, I, if I'm feeling kind of a panicky feeling around my heart, I just kind of pause. And like, I, first of all, I breathe. I consciously breathe. I breathe into, I, I breathe into my heart. And then... I just, you know, at the end of that breath, I don't, may not even ask the question out loud. I just kind of like, hmm, like, who are you? What's this about? What do I, like, what's going on? And so sometimes, um, so what's a recent situation where I use this? Um, so I had a situation, I was, talking, I was thinking about a client today. And I felt this real heaviness about this client, that this client is really stuck. And, you know, I just kind of went in and I thought, what's this about? And I just was like, and I just sat with it. And I just, I, I didn't think, like the, the purpose of the conscious breathing is to stop the mind. By focusing on the breath, my mind isn't thinking. But then in that moment, when it feels right, I just kind of pose a question. I feel the question. I kind of think the question 
And the answer I got, I got back was the person is giving, trying to give me the answers I want to hear rather than tell me where they're at. So now I can learn from that and pose question around that. So I believe that our bodies are a mirror that hold the energy of our own emotions, judgments, anxieties, concerns, and thoughts. It holds that energy and it gives us a clue as to how, what we need to do to move forward. Is that helpful? Or is it, that's kind of a little no, airy fairy. So. A little bit, but I, I think, you know, the breathing and slowing down the thought, I think right. often allows us to see through the fog, right? That's almost like putting on the high beams. That's what focus is. And then yep. from there, right, if we can just then ask it again, right, what's this feeling about? Why do, do I? It, what's just keep about? asking. Yep, yeah, get just, there and breathe and just be patient. And yeah. while it's a little bit kind of, you know, it is a little bit up there, but if we really think about it, we know the answer. Right. We just have to be present with it and, and, and sit there until we can figure out or, you know, get through it to your client that's saying what they want, what they think you want to hear. Once you understand that, it allows you, A, to push a little harder in some places, and B, it allows you to be a little softer in others because right. you might cut them a little bit of slack because they might not know how to receive coaching. Correct. And as well, allow me to then pose a question from a different angle. That's you know, right. So we, we know, and so to paraphrase, so you know, the other day when we were talking, when you said this and this, can you expand on that and tell me what you meant? Where, where were you coming from? What were you feeling? What was going on for you there? And, you know, that coming at it from a different angle, from a fresh perspective. And I guess the other thing is, is that um, even though a lot of, I, you know, I when I would do my, my workshops and seminars, and so, so I probably did 400 events over a six year period because I did the weekly workshop uh, every week for six years straight. Uh, and then I did the marketing safari seminar. There was seven. I had four of those workshops on going on at any one time, but here's, here's the point. The numbers aren't, aren't important. What I remember a client saying, well, you know, how, how did you get to this point? How were you able to put this workshop on? How did you, you know, and then, you know, we, we see that you're using the principles that you're teaching. I said, because I fail, I was willing to fail more. I was willing to learn more. And, to, and, I, and I kept get up, getting back up. I had to. I had the family to feed. So I had no back door. No plan B. No back door, no... In this, to a certain way, sometimes having too much money this prolongs how long it's going to take you to learn something. Interesting. That's what I've found with a lot of businesses is that uh, some you know, I've seen clients with money that they could spend and throw and, and uh, to try to solve a problem, and they bring me in and so what do you think the problem is? So you're not learning anything. <laughs> you're not you're not learning what you need to learn. What do you mean? And then we'd review. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're right. So how do I learn that? Well, let's ask, let's, let's get curious about it. And so I, I get them to go out and start talking to their customers and asking questions. Well, why do I want to do that? Well, because it cut, you can, I want you to learn. I want you to ask the same questions of the customers that said no from buying from you. I want you to ask the same questions from the customers that said yes and bought from you. It's a, just as important. We tend to pay, spend more time trying to learn from our rejections than we do trying to learn from our successes. Ah, there's a good lesson for us, Greg, right? To ask the customers that have already bought why they buy, ask yeah. them for permission maybe to buy more, right? to offer them more value, and then find out who else they know that they might be able to refer you to. Right on. So, cool. So that's, that's a really long answer to a short question. <laughs> well, that's okay though, right? I mean, sometimes the easiest questions have the most complex answers. Yeah, it's just be curious. Uh, ask great questions. Keep asking questions. Keep asking questions. <laughs> well, good lesson, Greg. Good stuff. Thank you. Yeah. And so, anybody that's interested, if uh, 
if you're if you're curious and you'd like to talk to me, just pick up the phone. You can call me at 403-307-8281. You can email me, uh, uh, gregbd, G-R-E-G-B-D at map.com if you want. I'm here. It doesn't cost anything to talk. Just give me a call. Don't stay stuck. Step yeah. into step into the the possibility of what might be. Yeah. Get Thanks, asking bro. questions. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, get off. Get off. Get on your ask. There you go. <laughs> there you go. All right.